Thank you very much. Good morning and assalamu alaikum. It's a real privilege for me to be here because Bangladesh is my country of origin. So I'm going to discuss antihypertensive therapy for preeclampsia and eclampsia management. And I don't need to convince you that effective management of preeclampsia and eclampsia requires e effective management of hypertension. Um, I will not be speaking about uh, mild to moderate hypertension in my presentation. I'm going to be focusing strictly on severe hypertension. Um, the reason being that mild to moderate hypertension remains controversial, and it is still not clear whether normalization of blood pressure in that situation results in, in, results in optimization for the baby. However, there is a large international study underway to answer the question of whether tight control or less tight control of blood pressure is superior. So today I have three objectives for my presentation. The first one is that I will define what severe hypertension is. The second, I'm going to convince you that severe hypertension needs to be treated. And third, we'll discuss the choice of antihypertensive therapy. So I'm going to set the background and put the issues in context, and there's two points I'm going to make. The first is that we need to consider the natural history of preeclampsia. It's such that we're actually working with a fairly short time frame, because if women have early severe preeclampsia, we have, we're only going to be gaining about two weeks. And this was shown in randomized control trials, as well as a systematic review of 72 observational studies. And of course, if a woman is near term or at term, she's going to be delivered. So really, again, to reiterate, we're dealing with a short period of time. The other important point to recognize is that cerebral autoregulation in pregnancy is different than the non-pregnant state. Pregnancy likely shifts the curve to the left. And there are controversies in this area, particularly they relate to whether or not we also need to account for relative and acute changes in blood pressure. So with these two points in mind, I'd like to go through what the definitions of severe hypertension are in the major guidelines. So these are the five major guidelines, and I think everyone is probably familiar with them. We have the Canadian SOGC guidelines, the UK NICE guidelines, the American Society of Hypertension guidelines, the Australasian SOMANS guideline, and of course you heard from Dr. D'Souza, the WHO guidelines. So here are the definitions according to four of the five guidelines. The WHO doesn't put a specific recommendation as to what the definition should be, whereas these regional guidelines do. And you will note that the Australasian SOMANS guidelines recommend a blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure target of 170, whereas everybody else targets the 160. And the diastolic is standard across all of them. So why should we treat severe hypertension? The reason is severe hypertension carries an increased stroke risk. And it is the systolic uh, blood pressure that is a predictor of, of stroke rather than the diastolic. This slide here uh, talks about a retrospective case series of 28 women, and this is a 2005 study. Now, a lot of these cases were identified through legal proceedings, but the point is that 96% of the women who went on to have intracranial hemorrhages, their systolic blood pressure right before the stroke was 160 or greater, and 100% of them had a blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 150 or higher. And this is confirmed by the UK confidential inquiries into maternal and child health. In their 2007 report, they commented that 12 of the 18 directed maternal deaths were due to intracranial hemorrhage. And this was a result of substandard care because these women with severe hypertension did not receive antihypertensive therapy. So they actually went on to make the use of antihypertensive therapy in severe hypertension one of their top 10 recommendations. 
So going back to the WHO recommendations, which you've heard a lot about, the WHO does say that women with severe hypertension should be treated with antihypertensive therapy. And the thing to note here is that while the quality of evidence may be low, this was a strong recommendation by the WHO. And secondly, the WHO says that when women are treated for severe hypertension, the root and the agent is dependent on the local context. Now here the evidence was also low quality and the recommendation is weak, but again to go back to Dr. D'Souza's presentation, he did say that the WHO recommends a couple of good options, mainly being hydralazine and nifedipine. So where is the evidence coming from? So these are the major sources of data. So there's the 2010 NICE guidelines, which are the most up-to-date guidelines, the Cochrane reviews, and the British Medical Journal. Now there was different methodology used in these three studies, mainly because they used different inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, for the studies that they did include. I'd like to take a moment to talk about hydralazine, however, because it has been recommended by the WHO, and I will show you later that it is an agent that's widely available. This is from that BMJ systematic review that looked at parenteral hydralazine and compared it to um, nifedipine and libidolol, but mainly nifedipine in, these, um, in the systematic review. And you will see that Persistent severe hypertension was reduced with the use of hydralazine, but there was an increased incidence of maternal hypotension. And for perinatal outcomes, there was adverse fetal heart rate effects. So while, so while um, hydralazine is an acceptable choice of drug, we would probably say based on this evidence that it's probably not the drug of first choice. And now I'd like to also take a moment to talk about the use of just oral antihypertensives. Our group, the preempt group, actually looked into this with the idea in mind that perhaps using oral antihypertensives for the management of severe hypertension may be a feasible option, particularly in the low and middle income country setting, because it requires less resources. So we undertook a systematic review and found 14 eligible trials in pregnancy. And mainly these studies looked at nifedipine. Again, the comparison arms were either hydralazine or libidolol. And we found that nifedipine compared favorably with parenteral hydralazine. But again, as with any antihypertensive agent, the incidence of maternal hypotension was higher. So I'd like to also make a point about the use of nifedipine with magnesium sulfate because many of these women with severe uh, preeclampsia or severe hypertension may be getting concurrent magnesium sulfate. And we know that MagSulf is not an antihypertensive agent, but they may be, somebody might be using nifedipine with it. And in the literature and in reality, there's a lot of fear around the concurrent use of nifedipine with MagSulf mainly that of neuromuscular uh, blockade. However, this has not been borne out in the evidence, and a systematic review found that that risk is less than 1%. So if we were to use the two concurrently, it is actually very safe to do so. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit now and go back to the issues of availability and accessibility, which we discussed yesterday. And I think everybody in this room is familiar with essential medicines, but just to reiterate, these are an advocacy tool. So what our preempt group did here was that we looked at antihypertensive agents and their availability in national EMLs. And we tried to obtain as many EMLs as we could, and we got to 58 of them. And we looked at the availability of first IV antihypertensive agents, and you will see that hydralazine was quite prevalent with about 67.4% of EMLs having it. And here I've shown you different options because I think the point is that we need to use an antihypertensive agent that the local um, doctors or community healthcare workers are familiar with. We also looked at oral agents, and here you'll see that nifedipine and methyl dopa are very available with over 95% of EMLs having um, them 
And lastly, I'd just like to make a brief point about the priority medicines list, which was published by the WHO and focuses on 30 life-saving drugs for mothers and children. Now, this initial list did not have an antihypertensive agent for the management of severe preeclampsia, but we did write to them and we did get confirmation that the 2012 list will contain an agent, but we don't know what that agent will be at this point. So I'd like to summarize by saying that there's good consensus that severe hypertension with a systolic blood pressure of 160 to 170 should be treated. And the emphasis is on treatment and not the specific antihypertensive agent. It is important to remember that hypotension can occur with any agent. And just like outside of pregnancy, our blood pressure goal in a severe preeclampsia or hypertension, which you can think of as a hypertensive urgency, should be slow, especially with the cerebral autoregulation being shifted to the left. The most studied antihypertensive agents are labetalol and hydralazine parenterally and oral nifedipine. And there is no definitive differences, but based on the evidence, we don't think that hydralazine is the first uh, drug of choice or the drug of first choice. Um, oral antihypertensive agents like nifedipine may be a reasonable choice in low and middle income countries, especially in the facility setting. And finally, that essential medicines lists have at least one option available for the treatment of severe hypertension. Thank you.